Um, and so you may recall, and I found a source of talk here, so it's pretty exciting, that we are talking about this problem here, that I have an output, I have some transfer function, and I have an input here. Okay? And I taught you, or we've been learning, the way that we get this transfer function if we have an ODE, right, and you take the little positive <coughs> transform of that, and then you get this representation. You take the differential equation, you linearize it, and necessarily you take Laplace transform, and then you get an algebraic expression that you can rearrange for the output in terms of the input, and the thing that multiplies the input is called the transfer function. And we've been talking about transfer functions that look like this. <coughs> First order, and they have a gain, and they have a time constant. Okay. And then, we did this, the primary, the most of this lecture had to do with, we had a first order transfer function that looked like this. I gave you a particular input function, a step function, a ramp function, a sinusoidal function, right? And so we learned that if you know this input is a function of time, then you can find it as a function of s. Sorry. Right? And so you can find the G by taking the um, Laplace transform of the differential equations using the initial condition. You can find the U of T by taking the Laplace transform of the, the function um, U of T. And then you multiply these things together and hopefully you can take the inverse Laplace transform right, and find the Y of T back. That's, that's the game. Okay. And so we focused last time on first order systems that look like this. And now I'm talking about a class of systems that look like this. Okay. So this is first order. Okay, this thing here is called integrating. Why is it called integrating? Well, you'll see in a minute from this example. Okay. So let's say I, I give you this problem here. Okay. So this is a liquid storage tank, so even though I don't give you the equation, you can imagine what's happening here. You have a volumetric flow rate QI going in. You have a volumetric flow rate Q leaving. They both can be functions of time. Uh, the paper tank is cylindrical, and so what I've done here is a mass balance on the tank. Okay. So, um, so just for completeness, it started like this. B, B, T of rho A, H. Right. That's rho is the density of the fluid, A times H is the volume, so this is the mass of fluid in the tank, derivative of the accumulation. And so that equals rho um, QI, that's the mass flow rate into the tank, minus rho Q, that's the mass flow rate out of the tank. And then you cancel the rows, and you pull the A out, right, and then you get that equation. So it's just a mass balance. All right, so conceptually, if you want to find what the level is, right, you're going to Rearrange this equation, integrate both sides of the equation. So all I've done is rearrange so that on the left-hand side is only dh, and integrate that from some initial value, h bar, for steady state value, or a nominal value, let's say, to some value ht. That's easy, that's trivial to do, right? That just gives you h of t minus h bar. And then I've integrated the right-hand side of the equation from uh, time equals zero to time equal t. Obviously, h is h bar time equals zero, and, a, and at t, it's the value of h of t. Okay. All right, so this gives you some idea why this is called an integrating system. If you look at the level, which is h of t, it's the integral of the difference in the flow in and out. Okay. So in other words, the level you're going to get depends on not the values of the flow rate themselves, but rather the difference between those flow rates integrated, and that will be the level. Okay. What is this telling you? It says the level quits changing when the flow in and out are equal to each other. Does this make sense to you? Right? You got a tank, flow in equals flow out, level will be constant. Um, but you can't tell, as, as I'm going to make this point, you can't tell what the level is from. So if, if I said find the steady state level, right? This is a common problem. You get a differential equation if they find the steady state, right? Um, you, can't find, you can't find the steady state level from this equation. Do you agree? 
So if the derivative equal to zero, set it equal to zero, what do you find? QI equals Q at steady state. There's no information about what H is at that point. Right? <coughs> so that's a characteristic of an integrating system. Okay? They don't really have a they don't really have um, a steady state in that sense that you can solve for. So the level is going to be the steady the steady state level is going to be whatever it is when the two flows are equal to each other. Right? So it's going to wander around. So if you were, plot, you were to plot the level versus time, then you know, it's going to maybe do something like this, who knows. And then once the levels are equal to each other, then you'll get some steady state level. But you won't be able to calculate that is, what that is from the equation, because it depends on the integral of the flows over the whole time period. So. It would be very mean of me to tell you, for example, to find the steady state level from this equation. So if I'm interested in a steady state level, I have to tell you what it is. You can't find it from this, this equation. Okay. All right. So do a little analysis here with a little cost transform. As usual, I want to get a deviation variable. Right? We learned you can take this equation, set it equal to zero, write the steady state equation, subtract it from the differential equation, or you can just put primes on everything. Right? That's all I meant. So that's a deviation form. Now every variable is the difference between that variable and its steady state value. Okay. All right, take Laplace transform of both sides of the equation. So here, take, you pull out A, take Laplace transform of this derivative, that's S times Laplace, uh, Laplace variable, minus the initial condition. But the reason we use deviation variables is because H prime of 0 is 0. Right. H prime of t is h of t minus h bar. So h prime of 0 is h of 0 minus h bar. And we're going to choose h of 0 to be h bar. Sorry, that's, I guess I won't write that low in the future. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So, sorry, I won't do that again. Um, so that's what. When we take Laplace transform of these deviation variables, essentially you'll never see the initial condition here because it's always going to be zero because we're always going to start the system in a steady state. Okay. All right, so take the right-hand side, Laplace variable of this, minus Laplace variable of this. Okay, solve, as usual, for the dependent variable, the output, which is in this case is the level in terms of the inputs, which are these two things, and you get an equation that looks like this. Okay. So again, I mentioned this when we first introduced Laplace transform. If you see an S floating around, a 1 over factorable 1 over S terms, that means the system is an integrating system. Okay. So th this equation is equivalent to that equation. Just this one's in the Laplace domain, and that's in the time domain. Okay. So if I looked at this equation, and someone said, what is happening? I'd say, well, the level is the integral of the difference between the inlet flow and the outlet flow, because I know 1 over S is the integration. So it's the same information as that equation there. All right. So if we'd like to compute the step response to this system, then um, generically, so this is an example. This is the general case. Uh, uh, integrating system has a transfer function that looks like k over s. Right? So if you look at this example here, you consider either of these two things to be the input. Let's just say we're interested, interested in just changing the inlet flow, not the outlet flow. Then this looks like k over s times this. In this case, k is 1 over a. Right? 1 over a times over s times this. In the other case, it would be minus 1 over, 1 over a times s. So generically, you can represent any integrating system as a k over an s. Okay. All right. So as usual, if we want to find the uh, response of this system to an input change, take the transfer function, where the integrating system is this, multiply times the input change. This is a step change, right, of magnitude m. We talked about that. Um, and then you multiply the two together, you get this. Then you go to your table of uh, Laplace transforms, and you'll find that 1 over s squared gives you something called t, something called the time. And then you multiply that times the constant. Okay. So this, is, this seem, may seem like a weird kind of system, right? Because when we took a step change, like here's u of t, and here's t, and the system, okay, so the step change looked like this, time equals zero, oops. It went up to m, and we learned that the system was first order, 
this is from last time, it starts at zero and then it exponentially goes up like this, right? So the response of the first order system to a step change. But an integrating system based on this thing goes up like a ramp and the slope of that thing is k times m. So weird system, right? Usually if you put a bounded input, that's what this thing is, a bounded input into a system, you get a bounded output. But if the system integrates, you get an unbounded output. Okay. The reason for this, if you just look at the physics behind this, it's pretty simple, right? If I'm initially at a point where the inlet flow equals the outlet flow, let's say, then the level will be constant. If I change the inlet flow upwards and I leave the outlet flow the same, then there's an imbalance, right? More material is coming in than leaving. And if I keep it that way, then the level is just going to keep going up forever in principle or until it overflows or something like that. All right? Okay. So um, in this sense, we say you know, the integrating system doesn't really have a steady state gain. Okay? You put in a, a, like a nice bounded, let's say, step change, and you get a ramp very quickly. You might think this is a, not an important problem for us, but if you look at a typical plant, um, systems that are described by equations like this are some of the most difficult to control. I mentioned that when you have a typical plant, before every major unit operation, you have a big drum that just holds inventory before the reactors, before the columns, um, just holds inventory. And those systems look just like these systems described by equations look just like that. Yeah. Um, I'm confused about how this looks different from like the other linear examples that we've done. So why you had to integrate it? You couldn't just take the Laplace transform? Yeah, I mean, if I, I, I did this just to point out the physics behind the time, <coughs> the time domain, because I thought that would be useful to you to see. But if I, if I just simply wanted to, I could tell you, and first of all, I wanted to explain to you why does an integrating system have a transfer function that's like k over s? Right, so that's what this example showed you, right? If you take e any one, either of these inputs, you consider this the input or this the input, it doesn't matter. It look, the trend thing that multiplies it looks like k over s. Okay? So the first thing I'm trying to do is tell you why I represent a transfer function for integrating system like k over s. Okay? The second thing I'm trying to do with this example is try to give you some physical interpretation for this answer. Okay, so why, if I put in a step change, does the ramp, does the level just in, keep increasing with time? That's what this answer tells you. Okay. And it's because of the, you have to maybe to fully understand, look at the time domain answer here. So, yeah. Well, I already explained it. So, so there's really two, two goals, right? One is to explain why this is the transfer function of an integrating system and why an integrating system has this type of response to a step change, which is a lot different than the first order system, which looks like this. Okay. Is that sufficient? Answer? Okay. All right. All right, well, that took a long time. It's my own fault, I guess. So now it's on to this. We certainly won't be finishing this lecture today, so we'll get a little bit behind, but that should be all right. Um, okay, transfer functions part two. Okay. So, so far, we've learned the following, that if the system looks like this, first order, Okay, I taught you what the response of the system looks like to a step change into a ramp change to a sinusoid. And then I said if the system looks like this, which we call integrating. I showed you just seconds ago what it looks like to a step change. Okay. Now we're going to talk about systems that are a little more complex in the sense that transfer functions are more complex. And we're going to focus the first part of the lecture on something called second order systems. So for second order systems, this denominator, instead of being a first order, an S will be second order. And then I'll go through lots of analysis of that case because it's quite common and quite important. And then after I do that, I'll make a point of what's, how are we going to take this um, analysis? So I don't want to do first order, second order, third order, fourth order. But I have a lecture every day where we increase the order. Um, so the second part of the lecture, which is really, let's say, part two and maybe some extent part three is based on how do we determine something about the response of the system for any order system, arbitrary order. Okay. So hopefully by studying first and second order, that will help you understand how to extrapolate this thing to higher order systems. Okay. 
Then, I'll, I don't even know if I'll get to this today, probably not. We'll talk about, reiterate some stuff about time delays, and at the end I'll do a, a little example of a simulator. All right. So, this is what a second order transfer function looks like. So, I'm going to give you an example in a minute of a physical example you get this for, but for now, just bear with me. So, again, typical thing, you're looking for a transfer function that relates the input to the output. So, sometimes we'll write, you know, y equals g times u, or we might write, well, y over u equals g. Same thing, because they're just algebraic quantities. And a second order system, generally, the most general form, looks like this. Okay. So K is the steady state gain. It has the same interpretation it had for a first order system. It's the amount, the output will change for a given change in the input from one steady state to another. Tau has the same interpretation as well. It's a measure of how quickly the system responds. If tau is small, the system responds quickly to an input change. If it's large, it's slow. The new parameter here and was pointed out by one of your colleagues in the audience is squiggly. All right. And squiggly has some official name in, in the Greek alphabet, but it's not really worth learning. So we'll call it squiggly. Um, and this is called the damping coefficient. Okay. And this is what's new about a second order system is it has this new parameter squiggly. And depending on the value of squiggly, you can see a lot of different behaviors. Okay. And we'll be, I'll be pointing that out. Okay, so if you just looked at this from a purely um, algebraic standpoint, if the squiggly is greater than one, okay, how, let's say you want to factor that denominator, right? You want to see what the roots of that denominator are. Then I can tell you if squiggly is greater than one, you can factor that denominator into two real roots, okay? And you can rewrite the denominator like this, right? So use the quadratic equation to calculate the roots, you'll find one root is s equal minus 1 over tau 1, and the other one is s equal minus 1 over tau 2. You have to calculate what tau 1 and tau, tau 2 are. I'm just saying it's guaranteed you can factor the denominator into two real distinct roots if squiggly is greater than 1. To find a tau 1 and tau 2, you have to actually do it. Or I'll give you a formula here in a few minutes that will show you what it is. If the squiggly is identically equal to 1, then you get real roots, but it's repeated, right? The root is going to be s equal minus 1 over tau. You can hopefully see that squiggly is 1. That looks like tau s plus 1 squared. Right, same thing. So that's why I wrote it like this. Okay? So in some sense, this system here, okay, we call this overdamp. So if I say the, second, the system is second order overdamp, <coughs> it means it has a squiggly greater than 1. If I tell you it's second order critically damped, then it has a squiggly equal to 1. Um, so these cases are not all that much different, as you'll soon see, than the first order system. The real new one is this one. Okay, if squiggly is between 0 and 1, we're not considering squigglies that are less than 1 right now, for reasons I'll explain later. If squiggly is between 0 and 1, the system's underdamped, and there's no way to factor that into real roots. So in other words, if you factor that, you get a complex conjugate pair of roots. Okay. This is called underdamp. And a system has this property, it can exhibit different behaviors than you can see with the first order system. So this, for example, can uh, exhibit oscillatory solutions. Okay. So in other words, I can put a step change into a system that looks like this, and the output can oscillate. You can never see that with the first order system, and you can never see that with these two cases either. Okay. So this is the kind of interesting case. So we'll focus on that quite a bit. Okay. So the purpose here is to prove that this can happen. So they have an example in the book, which um, is one of those things every year I teach the course, I bring up the same example and complain that this is a really terrible example. But yet I use it every time. So finally, I decided to change it. So I just made my own example. This is not in the book, but it's a lot simpler than the example in the book. And so <coughs> it consists of um, a CSTR. Okay, so the reaction is A goes to B goes to C, so it's a series type reaction. It's isothermal and it's constant volume. Okay. And I'm, I'm guessing at this point, when I write equations like this, it's not a mystery where these come from. But obviously, I've specified some kinetics here, right? It's a reactor. So, what is the reaction <coughs> rate um, R1 of the first reaction? It's a K1 times the concentration of Ca. Right? And this is 
If someone asks you, what's the kinetics of the reaction that goes A to B, wouldn't the simplest thing you come up with would be a reaction rate constant times a concentration of A? Okay. Could be A squared, <coughs> or it could be zeroth order, but usually it'll be first order in the reactants, right? And there's only one reactant. And same thing with the second reactor. I have a reaction. I assume that the rate is K2 times the concentration of B, because that's the reactant, which I haven't written. I probably should, but I did. All right, and then I did component balances. I didn't do a mass balance because I, I can see this reactor is constant volume. Okay, and it's constant volume, and we always assume constant density. It just says the flow in and out are equal to each other. So I didn't even bother. Okay. I don't need an energy balance because I told you it's isothermal. So it looks like I need component balances. So first thing I did is write a component balance on A, and then I wrote a component balance on B. So these, uh, the units of these concentrations are assumed to be mass per unit volume. So if I look at the accumulation term, the CA is the concentration of A in the reactor liquid. Okay. If I multiply that times the volume of liquid in the tank, I get the mass or the mass of A in the tank. If I take the derivative, I get the accumulation of A. Okay. That's got to be equal to the flow rate, mass flow rate of, let's see here. No, no, fine, sorry, my fault. All right, so if we look at the, the um, flow going into the system, it has a flow of Q. It's, the flow into the system is Q, and the flow out of the system is also Q, but it's constant volume, constant density. The concentration of the feed is assumed to be pure A, okay? There's no B in the feed, just A, and the concentration is CAF. Okay, so if you multiply a volumetric flow in something like I'll use SI units, meters cubed per second, thank you, small flow. Uh, meters cubed per second times the concentration here, which is um, mass per volume, you'll get mass per <coughs> unit time. Right? Those two things will give you mass per unit time, so the same, same as the accumulation time. This is the flow of A out of the system in units of mass per time, and this is the accumulation of A by the first reaction. It's not done participate in the second reaction. Reaction rates are always specified per unit volume. Okay, so you can see I multiplied times the volume. Okay, so accumulation equals in minus out uh, plus generation equals consumption in this case. So here's the balance on B. I'm guessing from kinetics this should look pretty familiar. This I hope it does. Um, there's the accumulation term. There's no B fed to the reactor, but it is uh, taken out of the reactor by flow. It's produced by reaction one. It's consumed by reaction two. All right, so now I need to put the model in a set of, uh, let's say, deviation forms, like a particular cost transform, because it's more convenient, we like deviation variables. And at this point, I give you some parameter values. So Q over V are only here as a ratio, so I'm just giving you Q over V is 2, K1 is 1, and K2 is 2. Okay. So at this point, um, what I've done here is take that equation, I divided both sides by B, obviously, okay, to get this form. And then I put in deviation form just by putting primes over everything. Again, you could take the steady state version of that equation, subtract it from the dynamic equation, and get deviation form, but this is a lot easier, quicker. Okay. Then I substituted the parameter values in. So this is 2, that's where I get this. Then this is minus 2, minus 1, that gives you minus 3 times. Do the same thing for the second equation. Divide by V, put it in deviation form. I forgot a prime there, sorry. The examples have their risks. Okay. It should be prime there. Okay, so that's the deviation form of the second equation. Uh, plug in the parameter values, and you get this. Okay. So there we have it. You have two equations. Um, and let's say, for example, that we're interested in how will the concentration of B change if we change the inlet concentration of A? Let's say that's the problem we're interested in. Okay. So I want to know if I change the inlet concentration of B as some function of time, how will the concentration of B coming out of the reactor change the function of time? Okay. So this is going to end up giving a second order transfer function. And in order to do this, you see I had to take an example of two differential equations. You can't get a second order transfer function from a single differential equation. 
And so if I tell you a transfer function is second order, that means it came from a description of two differential equations. Okay. If I tell you a transfer function is third order, it came from three differential equations. If I tell you tenth order, it came from ten differential equations. Okay. So the order of the system is, is going to be the denominator of this transfer function here. Okay. And if it's second order, that will be the same as the number of differential equations from which the transfer function was derived. Okay. Here we go. We have two differential equations now. So this will be the first example you've seen where you have two differential equations. You have to combine them via the Laplace transform. It's not very hard, but we'll see how to test. So first thing I'm going to do is take the Laplace transform of the first equation. Now this ends up being a little bit simpler example. I probably should have made the first order. Uh, why is it not too bad? Do you see B does not appear in this equation, right? So I'm going to take the Laplace transform of this equation. I'm going to solve that equation for CA in terms of CAF. And then I'll use that when I take the Laplace transform of the second equation. Normally, CB might appear in this equation. And it's just more algebra that the same, same logic applies. Okay. All right, so take the Laplace transform of this equation. I get S times the Laplace transform of CA minus the initial condition, which is going to fall out as usual, because we'll assume we start the system in a steady state. And then take the Laplace transform of the right hand side. And that's that. Okay? And then I want to solve this equation for this particular problem. I've told you verbally that this is the input of interest, this is the output of interest. And CA is some intermediate variable. Okay? It's not the variable of interest, but it has to be dealt with. So what I'm doing now is I'm solving this equation that I get by taking the Laplace transform for CA in terms of CAF. Okay. It's quite, I hope you can see it's quite easy there. I bring, this, bring the CA term over here and divide by S plus 3 and get that there. Okay? All right. I know I want to do this because I know I'm going to need this in the next step so I can eliminate CA when I take the cost transform this equation. Okay? All right? All right, so take the cost transform the second equation. Again, the left hand side. S times CB minus the initial condition, which will be zero, because deviation variable. There's the right hand side, <coughs> CA minus 4CB. Solve this equation now for the output of interest, which is CB in terms of the CA. Okay. So now I have this expression for CB in terms of CA. And then on the previous page, I have CA times. Um, <coughs> Of the CAF. So, I should probably put a line on the board like this. So you can't see anything below this point, right? At least. All right. So maybe that'll keep me from doing it. All right, so what do we have? On the previous page, we have what? We have C um, A prime of S equal, I can't remember what it is. It's a 2 over S plus 3. 2 over S plus 3 times C A F prime. And then on this slide, we have C B prime of S equal. do is just multiply these two things together. Uh, something seems <laughs> very perverse here. Okay. There we go. That's it. Okay. So I'm going to take this thing here and put it into that. Okay. Just eliminate CA. These are just algebraic, these are just algebraic equations. Okay. So I'm going to plug this thing in right here and I'm going to end up <coughs> with this. All right, so that, you can tell at this point, it doesn't look like the forms I showed you on the previous page, but you can tell this is second order already, right? If you multiply this out, you're going to get an S squared term value in the second order. Okay. If you multiply it out and got S to the fifth, it would be fifth order. All right, so I want to put it in standard form. Remember the standard form I like? 
is a k over a tau 1 s plus 1 times quantity tau 2 s plus 1. So to do that, I'm going to, what? Looks like I'm going to divide both sides of the equation, sorry, top and bottom of the equation, I'm going to divide by 12. Right. Why? Because then I can divide this thing by 3 and this thing by 4. That's 12. Divide the top by 12. I mean, nobody's lost at this point. I hope it doesn't kill. Okay. Alright. Alright. So this, there's your k. For this problem, k is 1 6. Tau 1 is 1 3rd, and then tau 2 is 1 4. Alright. Um, and so the systems I described, right, I gave you three forms of the second order depending on the value of squiggly. So this is clearly a case that we call over-damped, right? You can factor it in two real roots. You can see it's already factored, so obviously it must be good. Okay. So this is, this is an over-damped system. <coughs> okay, so now what we want to do, given that I, so it's the, it's the same kind of thing I always, the game I've been playing, right? First thing I do is I give you an example, convince you the thing I'm talking about exists. Like second order transfer functions exist. There's the existence group right there. And then now I'm going to go and do some generic analysis on a second order system that looks like for any k, any tau 1, and any tau 2. Okay. So this point would just give you a physical example showing that this is what you'll get. Okay. So clearly, um, if I want to give you a second order example, I've got to, you've got to start with two differential equations. Alright, so there we go. There's our system <coughs> proof, let's say. Alright, so this is a little sidebar. What if the system is nonlinear? Okay. So in other words, you write out your two component balances, and let's say the kinetics weren't linear. Like I told you that R1 equals K1 times C A squared. Then the system wouldn't be linear. Then you'd have to linearize it. Okay. All this slide tells you is how you go about linearizing. It's no different than what you've done before, it's just more of the same. So if you end up with a set of nonlinear differential equations, let's say this was the balance for CA and this was CB, and you're like, oh, it's not linear. Don't take the Laplace transform of an equation that's not linear. Okay, also known as nonlinear. Um, because it's not a legitimate operation. You can only use the Laplace transform of linear differential equations. So. If the system is nonlinear, you have to linearize it. What's the first step in doing linearization? Find a steady state, right? So I always want to linearize about a steady state. So if you have two differential equations and you want to find a steady state, you have to set the true derivatives equal to zero and solve those two equations simultaneously. So what would I do? I give you u. I should have probably called it u bar, by the way. I'm not sure why I didn't do that. I just have a typo. It should be u bar everywhere else. Correct the slide. So I would give you a steady state value of the input called u bar, and then you'd find by solving these two equations simultaneously y1 bar and y2 bar. Could you do this by hand? Maybe. Depends on what the equations look like. You could certainly do it in MATLAB. We talked about how to do that last semester. Okay, so now you've got in hand the steady state, u bar, y1 bar, and y2 bar. Now you want to do a first order Taylor series expansion of each of these equations about that steady state. So what does the Taylor series expansion tell you to do? Um, well, first of all, evaluate the function at the steady state. Again, <laughs> all these u's here should be u bar. Sorry, I cut and pasted. Okay. So first thing you have to do is take evaluate the function. So we're linearizing the first equation. Evaluate the right-hand side at the steady state. This will be 0, right? That's, what, that's how you found it in the first place. Okay. Then you're going to have three derivatives now. You're going to have one derivative involved.